So welcome everybody. This is so exciting to have all of you joining us and those of you who will be catching the replay. Uh, I'm gonna ask in the moment and we'll go over a few more requests as far as the logistics for this is please don't use the chat um, from here on out till the very end when we open up for Q and A. It's kind of distracting for Karen and myself and all the rest of the participants if people are putting chat things in there. Um, so thank you for those who started out by saying where you're from, and now we're going to close that and ask you to honor that. Uh, my name is Mayor Cromwell, and I uh, first want to say that in the information that was sent out, it made it sound like this is a ceremony, but this is really, it, it, there is a ceremony component to this, but this is really going to be a discussion between myself and Karen Tate on what is goddess spirituality and so a little bit about me and my background, if you don't know me, I am a, um, I'm the founder and director of the Great Mother Lovely nonprofit based in the United States in Ash near Asheville, Old Fort, North Carolina. And I'm a Gaia mystic, that, and this has been confirmed by a number of um, prominent Native American elders, which is really, really humbling. But it's the only way I could do this work publicly. So mother is yammering at me all the time. And she was brought into, when I say mother, mother Gaia, she was brought into my energy body in a ceremony. Um, her, her energy and her conscious were brought into my energy body in a ceremony with an Algonquin man, a uh, medicine man, back in 2012, early June, right after I was diagnosed with cancer. So mother kind of had me. She's like, if you surrender to me to the extent I'll ask you to surrender, Right. That's what she started talking to me right at the end of the ceremony. It was for her. Just two of us did it. And so this has been a wild and rollicking ride in full surrender to Mother Gaia. Um, so I'm a Gaia mystic. I'm a Gaia high priestess and healer. Uh, I'm the award winning author of a couple of messages, uh, communications with Mother, wisdom she wants the world to have right now. And I also lead the Great Mother Love a year long course and also organize global grids of ceremonies. I'll get into that more in a moment. Um, but, uh, I'm now going to pass this over. Actually, no, I'm going to introduce my incredible, um, friend and co-host, so to speak. And I have a ladybug, by the way, I have to show this to you. I don't know if you can see it. Do you see this ladybug here? <laughs> you know how it's ladybug? Get it? Goddess ladybug. I think I'm getting the message here. She's, they're all, they've been living inside our house here all late fall and winter but th for some reason and i think it's because the goddess is our focus the lady bug needs to crawl on my computer during this lovely discussion we're having <laughs> so anyway so karen tate is a thought leader speaker seven times published author podcaster and social justice activist karen is a caring e economy conversation leader and power of partnership presenter she has a certification from Smith College in the psychology of political activism, women changing the world. And she participated in the award-winning documentary film, Femme, Women Healing the World. Karen is a Joseph Campbell Foundation associate, and she has been named one of 13, the 13 most influential women in goddess spirituality, which is huge kudos. Her newest book, Normalizing Abuse, a commentary on our pervasive culture of abuse, was released in January, along with the return of her long-running podcast, Voices of the Sacred Feminine. And I will actually be interviewed by Karen next Wednesday in her podcast, and that information will be in the replay email. So if you'd like to join us again, um, it'd be wonderful to have you guys uh, hear Karen and I talk more then. Um, yeah. Her other book titles include Sacred Places of Goddess, 108 Destinations, which I actually have right here, if I can reach it. This is a really amazing chalk full of information about sacred sites devoted to the goddess that um, has been out 20 years, right, Karen? It's amazing. Um, um, I think it came out in 2006. Yeah. Okay, a little bit less. So Karen's written that. She's also written Walking an Ancient Path, Goddess Calling, Voices of Sacred Feminine, The Sacred Feminine, Conversations to Change Our World, Awakening the Feminine, and Goddess 2.0. So you know, 
Karen is also an interfaith minister who leads sacred tours. She lives in the Pacific Northwest with her husband of 35 plus years and their feline daughter, Lily. Mm -hmm. And I just really want to stress that it's really an honor, Karen, to do this conversation with you, this webinar, because your depth, your long, long, long-term commitment um, to the goddess is just huge. It's absolutely huge. So thank you. Well, you know, uh, when I discovered this, it uh, it changed my life. And I simply found, uh, you know, followed the breadcrumbs, you know, my spiritual and intellectual curiosity. And, um, you know, this is where it's led. Well, I, I love that you're here tonight with me and everybody else who's showing up for this. Um, so... Karen and I first connected just last year. However, I had one of her books years ago, but I didn't know it was her. <laughs> but I remember the name Karen Tate, like a big name in the goddess movement, so to speak. And um, and then a mutual friend connected us, and I asked Karen if she would be on the advisory council for the Thousand Goddesses Gathering Global Grid. And if you haven't heard of the Thousand Goddesses Gathering Global Grid, it is an annual a uh, unified field of ceremonies devoted to invoking the divine feminine and grounding these powerful divine feminine goddess energies into the earth to amplify Gaia's oneness grid, to help us heal what is going on around the planet that's been going on for centuries and centuries that has led us to this time of great chaos. And so uh, Karen and I got to know each other a bit last year. And then when the um, when the goddess global grid was over, I just had this little niggling thought, and this is how Mother Gaia works with me. It's like she plants little seeds. Sometimes she's really point blank, and then and sometimes it's little seeds. And I just knew that there needed to be a continuation to the thousand goddesses global grid that wasn't just join us next year. And I also do other webinars and interviews with other people and other events, but something really specific to the goddess. And so the goddess is absolutely huge. It's it's a, a massive topic and it's more than a topic. And so our hope tonight uh, is to really infuse you with some of the goddess energies to invite you to embrace the goddess into your life and into yourself and to see yourself even as a goddess even if you're a man um there's a divine feminine aspect to the masculine and vice versa and so we're really thrilled that you all are here with us tonight and um i also want to speak to karen's background being pretty radically different than mine uh, when Karen and I had a planning meeting a few weeks ago, we were like, okay, we're like 180 degrees apart because, and this is what you said, Karen, I'm like, well, that's a good point. However, you know, Karen comes from the academic intellectual end of things. I'm coming from Gaia mystic, uh, working with spirit all the time. Mother's talking to me all the time, having all these spiritual experiences. And I know you are too, Karen. Um, and yet the goddess is in the middle, you know, yeah. uh, so I don't have the extensive historical intellectual um, background that Karen has. Uh, but I'd like to think that I can bring the goddess forward with how much mother is embodied within my energy body and her consciousness. So, so the goddess is holding the whole spectrum between her and me and our various sort of realms. Um, and the goddess brought us together, truly. So again, the goals of this discussion, this webinar, the overarching goal is to inspire you to embrace the goddess and heal into her, to support full ascension in the birthing process that we are in the midst of for the new earth coming in. And uh, as I mentioned before, please restrain from using the chat box so we can stay focused. And, and also, um, please save your questions to the end. Uh, we are going to have a Q&A at the end. We're going to open it up and we're going to, we are going to, you know, end this at 90 minutes just to honor that this was our commitment to each other and to all of you. Um, and, and the last thing, this is a request really to your hearts, um, but to open your mind and your heart. And if something one of us says triggers you at all, because there are many different paths within the goddess realms, 
So if we say something that triggers you, uh, the invitation is to be open to the possibility that this may be an aspect of you that needs more loving up, more healing, or you just don't have to agree with what we say. But, um, you know, we're all in process. We're all on this journey together. So last thing I'm going to share is before we start ceremony is Karen and I are going to be using the term sacred the fem sacred feminine and divine feminine within the context of our conversation. And this is to convey the same thing. I say divine feminine, she says sacred feminine. Please don't get confused by that. Uh, and on that note, for all of you who did get a chance to grab a candle <laughs> before we started, we can now light our candles together because we are going to open up ceremony by doing this candle lighting. And I love to do sacred fire ceremony. I've done a lot of it. That's how actually how I wrote my second book with Mother Gaia called The Great Mother Bible was lots of fire ceremony with a wood stove. So to me, by having as many of us who have a candle and those of you who don't have one, you can join in with us regardless from the sacred fire in your heart is this invites spirit forward to start with for our, our evening or our day or whatever time it is in your time zone um, together. So having done that, let me call on the spirit teams who support me and the Great Mother Loveway to ask them to hold us in sacred space for this event. Oh, I am that I am humbly calling on the Great Mystery Source Creator, calling on the Creatrix, the great, great womb of creation, divine feminine in the universal realms, please hold us in sacred space for this event, this discussion, this ceremonial space, holding this discussion. Oh, I am that I am calling on Mother Gaia. Ho, oh, Mama. Mm, please bless us, Mother. Hold us in sacred space. I'm calling on all the divine masculine ones that I work with to do this work called the Great Mother Love Way and the overarching courses I lead, all the work for Mother Gaia within the Great Mother Love Way, calling on the Divine Feminine Ones, the names I won't list because it's kind of extensive, but you all in the spirit realms know who you are. Please hold us in sacred space, calling on all the other spiritual teams that support the Great Mother Love Way the angelic ones, the councils, the guardians. Please join us, hold us in sacred space for this beautiful event together. Calling on the stone people to help me stay grounded <laughs> with all the energy holding space for this and all the beautiful spiritual ones coming in. And any others who wish to support us. Oh, okay. Calling on the ancestors of all of us who are here, all of our ancestors serving the highest good for divine plan alignment, especially ones that date go way, 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 way back when the goddess was still really, really active and alive. We all have ancestors that date that far back. Welcoming you ancestors, hold us in sacred space, help us to remember, guide us. Oh. All right. So Karen, here we are. Would you like to start us off by sharing how your goddess journey slash adventure started? <laughs> well, um, sure. And uh, it, it, it has been quite a journey. And honestly, <clears throat> um, you know, no one's really more surprised than I. Um, I started out life uh, in New Orleans, Louisiana which to those of you here with us in the United States, uh, you probably know that's the Bible Belt. And uh, my family was Catholic. And uh, uh, so I was born into Catholicism. And I grew up in a place that was very, very racist and sepsist. And um, 
you didn't usually meet anybody um, who wasn't a Christian. Uh, maybe on a rare occasion you met a Jewish person, but uh, it it was not a very diverse world uh, that uh, you know that I lived in in New Orleans, and I would venture to say uh, for a lot of people who live there, um, I was probably the norm, I think. And uh, I will say that while I grew up a Catholic and uh, for a time I even wanted to be a nun, <laughs> um, uh, I, uh, you know, uh, Christianity didn't really fully get its hooks in me. Uh, my my uh, immediate family was not evangelical. Uh, they, they were what I would call cafeteria Catholics or casual Catholics. Um, so it wasn't uh, something that dominated our life. So I, I was free to explore and um, I was more interested in ancient cultures and um, no doubt some past life memories, but I was uh, really drawn to uh, the Egyptian culture. Um, like I said, who knows, unless it's past life stuff. And, um, and I was interested in metaphysics. So, um, you know, at, at, by the, when I was about 30, uh, I met my husband, who I'm still married to, and we decided um, we were going to move to California. He'd lived there earlier in his life, loved it. We'd been there on vacation, and we decided um, that that's where our future was going to be. So uh, we moved out to California, and I attended a learning annex class. Now, the learning annex back then was, you know, it was just one of these, you know, secular, um, it, you know, I hesitate to even call it a school. It was a place that organized lots of classes of all sorts from, you know, how to do your taxes to uh, how to be a model. And uh, I attended a class that was about finding the goddess within. Now, looking back, it was a very, it was a fluff class, you know, and um, and, I, and what I mean by that was that it was nothing scholarly about it. It was, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I hate to use the word shallow, but it, it was kind of shallow, but, you know, it cracked the door open. And it really started getting me thinking about goddesses, because prior to that, um, I didn't think much about goddesses beyond what I was taught in grade school. You know, you hear about Hera, you know, chasing after her philandering husband, Zeus, or uh, Aphrodite, goddess of love, you know, and, and you don't really ever learn the relevance of, um, you know, of these goddesses, particularly not you know, how they could be relevant in our life today. But, you know, there I was, and obviously uh, it must have made an impact because like that old saying, when the student's ready, the teachers appear, suddenly I started meeting these women who knew all about goddess. And um, I was intrigued. I, I was captivated, I have to say. Um, I, uh, I picked up the book by Marianne Zimmer Bradley, uh, The Myths of Avalon, which is sort of the um, Arthurian legends through the eyes of, uh, of uh, I think it was Morgana, his sister, who was a witch. But in this book, she's really a priestess of the goddess. And man, I couldn't put that book down. And of course it was this romanticized fiction, but um, you know, I was just further captivated and I started going to these group meetings that these you know, women that I met went to and started attending classes. And you know, before you know it, man, it was a slippery slope for me and I was hooked <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and that was the beginning. And, uh, you know, then before you know it, I'm getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And I'm going on sacred travels with my husband. And 
realize how potent that is to stand in these sacred places where goddess was worshipped at the center of these people's world, you know, at, at, in a particular time, standing in these archaeological sites and these ancient temples. And it really took it out of the realm of something you're just reading about in a book. And it, it really became real, you know, it's kind of like the difference between reading a recipe or tasting the food, you know, and um, I, I became dedicated to the subject and, you know, there's more to it, uh, but, you know, that's kind of the start. Mm. Thank you, Karen. And you know what, Karen, I owe you an apology because I was going to ask you to invoke ISIS. And I admitted that. So would you like to invoke Isis and anyone else on your spirit team that you didn't hear me mention um, as part of our ceremony in our space here? Please do. Sure. I'll, um, I, I, I did it silently, but uh, sure. Um, guardians, guides, ancestors, uh, you who have been with me since the beginning, Isis, Isis, Oseti, you who are all things and all things are you. Please embrace us in your golden wings and bestow upon us your grace as we gather tonight with open minds and open hearts to learn more about you. Ashi. Mm. Thank you. I felt her come in. Wonderful. So, um, so I'll talk a little bit about my background with the quote unquote goddess. Uh, first of all, like Karen, I grew up Catholic and my brothers were altar boys and uh but honestly I was a tomboy you know the baggier the clothes the more masculine the clothes that's how I lived for many many years trying to hide my femininity honestly and then Mother Gaia asked me to organize the first thousand goddesses gathering. And this was from reading a post on Facebook from Tree Sisters and Claire Devois, who's the founder of that, using this um, Tibetan prophecy as a way to raise money. And the Tibetan prophecy was that when a thousand goddesses or Tibetan Taras unite, the tone of our sacred earth will shift from fear to compassion. And Mother Gaia said to me in that moment when I read that on Facebook that and you're going to organize that in the physical. And I'm like, gulp, you know, that's a big one, mother. And so, of course, I said, and you're going to help. And she said, yes. But, but what it forced me to do was to start to understand what is the goddess? Because I in no way saw myself as what I was thinking was for a long time as a stereotypical goddess of a really sensual woman with a really sexy gown, kind of diaphanous, kind of floating through the building or through the fields. And men are kind of lusting for her. And I mean, I had all these stereotypical images in my mind. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I'm a tomboy. I was a park ranger in my early 20s. I'm out there chopping wood and hiking and I am not a goddess, you know. And so this journey of... um really uh, coming to understand more and more deeply who the goddess is and what the goddess is for me personally, um, just become became one that went deeper and deeper because this thousand goddesses gathering global grid is, is an annual event. And in my journey of healing and embracing my divine feminine more and more this has been embracing the goddess within me and also and i'm getting kind of ahead of ourselves here but um the my greater understanding of the goddess um so karen i would love to hear from you because your background is so extensive about the history um you know your studies of the goddess if you would share you know uh you, I know you've written books about this, so we don't have time for books, but whatever you can bring forward for us tonight, because it's it's vast. It's a huge, huge topic. It is. It is. And and if you'll indulge me a minute, I do want to read just a little paragraph from this book, which Please. was the first book. And, and it goes like this. In the beginning, God was a woman, and from her womb, she created all that is. Thus, she is all things, and all things are her. 
Many believe she was the sun, the stars, and the moon. She was the changing seasons, the growing seasons, and the very earth itself. Her spirit created, permeated, and transformed every living thing. She ruled over the fate of human beings, bestowing sovereignty, blessings, and justice. She was an icon of wisdom and protection. She created the cosmos and everything in it. She gave forth life, and at death it was to her one returned, only to be reborn again. The face of the life force itself was that of goddess, the divine feminine. That was true 30,000 years ago, and for millions, it is still true today. So mm -hmm. on, this, on this journey of mine, um, I started to discover how much more there was to goddess than, uh, you know, those... Um, you know, social studies or mythology classes I mentioned in grade school. And I started, um, uh, you know, really going in depth to know the history of all of this, because, you know, I'm, I'm one of these analytical Virgos. I'm not someone that, um, uh, you know, wants to dilute myself or, um, or, you know what, hang on one second. My TV just came on. I am so sorry. Give me a second. You know, while she's doing that, I just want to add that the fact that she has a white horse behind her in that painting, and then uh, I think it's a Pegasus. When she comes back, you'll see it. Those are really significant spirit team members of mine from way, way, way back. You know, when I first started learning about my spirit team. So when I saw that with behind Karen, I'm like, okay, we're connected here. This is good. <laughs> you know? Sorry, welcome back, that, Karen. Now. Oh, Light, good. I was talking right? about your Light. painting. Yeah. Light. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I discovered that obviously there was so much more to the sacred feminine. And and I'll admit at first I was I was really angry because I thought, how could there be so much to this? And I didn't hear a peep about it for the first 30 years of my life, living in the Bible Belt, right? And, uh, you know, of course we had Mary, but, you know, Mary wasn't uh, considered a god or a goddess. And, um, you know, she was more this passive intermediary between us and Jesus or God. So as I'm discovering the sacred feminine, I'm starting to realize that, you know, there's so, there's so many different layers to it. And of course, as a Catholic, it felt normal for me to look at goddess as a deity that resides in the heavens that we can pray to, and um, hopefully she, she will be beneficent. And if we have a relationship with her and it's, you know, one of reciprocity, you know, she will bestow goodness upon us. Um, and, you know, and I realize for a lot of people that's anti-intellectual, right? But there's also the other aspect of goddess, which is more of a psychological construct. You know, she is an archetype. She's a role model. And that's so important for women because we know that, you know, sociologists, anthropologists, psychologists, they tell us that if a woman grows up in a society without a feminine face of God, it affects her psychologically. You know, she is, um, you know, she devalues herself. She has lower self-esteem. And of course, I'm talking in generalities. Um, you know, women have a lower status in society and cultures where there isn't a feminine face of God. Uh, women tend to, uh, you know, they grow up feeling like they have to obey male authority. You know, there's lots of psychological things that happen when the sacred feminine is um, extricated from our society. And, you know, Rhian Eisler was one of my early mentors, and she wrote the incredible book. And, um, you know, this nonfiction book, alongside that wonderful fiction one I mentioned earlier, uh, I would say that book of Rianne's uh, really made an impact on me because it made me realize that the worship of goddess goes back 
more than 30 or 40,000 years. And Karen, just a um, brief interruption. What is, what is the name of Brianne's book again? Uh, the Chalice and the Blade. The Chalice and okay. the Blade. And, you know, not only did, um, did I discover, uh, and all of us who read her book, I mean, it's been translated in so many languages over the decades, you know, not only did we discover that these early cultures had a feminine face of God before patriarchy, which we're living in now, but, um, you know, the societies were structured different. Um, you know, there, there weren't always patriarchies. There were uh, matrifocal religions, matrilineal religions. And Heidi uh, uh, Abendroth has actually written a wonderful book on matriarchal societies that goes in depth about all of these different uh, women-centered uh, societies that actually existed on the planet. Um, and so, and what know, is the name of her book? Um, Sorry, I'm being rude here, but Heidi Abendroth. Yeah, I'll 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 get it later and, and tell you. It's kind of hard to keep my train of thought, but it's a uh, Heidi. Oh, okay, I'll stop. Sorry. And and, <laughs> and, uh, and I forget exactly, but I think matriarchal societies is in the title. Um, okay. So, so the idea, you know, uh, is wow, you know, life was really different. And it hasn't always been the way it is now. And not only is that informative, but it gives us hope that there are other ways of doing things and things can be better. And there were also, you know, more, uh, we believe, egalitarian societies or societies, as some scholars now call equalitarian societies, where the sexes were more equal. And uh, we think Minoan Crete might have been one of those societies. And it was um, in, in from records that they've been able to decipher. Um, and not everything's been deciphered, but from what they can glean, um, it really seems like society was structured with, um, you know, females at the head, potentially, um, you know, their records of, you know, women being, you know, owners of businesses and, you know, forms and, you know, leaders in uh, public life and probably even a queen um, and or or maybe a triad. Um, and, you know, like, for instance, the extra monies went to the common good. Um, and so it it, you know, it really starts to open your eyes that there was something else. And, you know, I said maybe, you know, 30, 40,000 years ago, there's also an artifact called the Acheulean goddess that was discovered in the Middle East. And while it is a controversial, um, you know, artifact, it's worth mentioning because it's been dated to be at least 200,000 years old. So, you know, this is important because patriarchal religion has, you know, uh, pales in comparison in terms of how long it's been around compared to how long people revered a goddess. And um, we believe that, uh, you know, the, the divine feminine or sacred feminine was originally the primary deity because, you know, in the Paleolithic and the Neolithic, you know, people didn't have the benefit of science. So they could see that women would bleed every month without dying. You know, women could birth life, you know, from, from their, from their womb and their yoni and their vagina. And I mean, this was powerful. This was magical stuff. And, you know, we, we believe that that's kind of what probably gave women a leg up because then she was looked, uh, looked upon as being associated with the earth itself who provided all we needed to sustain ourselves. So, you know, so goddess for me went from, you know, being this deity that resides in the heavens to being a role model for women, because now, you know, we look back and we know women probably discovered agriculture. And with that, communities and cities were able to develop. And, you know, there was animal husbandry and weaving and pottery. And we believe that that was all the creations of women. And these, uh, you know, these were actually looked upon as magical gifts and talents too, because you were 
transforming things from one thing into another, you know, a seed into a plant into something you ate or the clay into a coil and it became a pot, you know, and so, you know, women were looked upon as these magical and, you know, and very powerful. And, but then, you know, then things start to shift and, you know, we get, you know, as time goes on, you know, in, into patriarchy, but, you know, so, but for me, you know, here goddess has gone from this, you know, deity that resides in the heavens who maybe hears our prayer to this psychological construct that lets women know they're not second class citizens. They're not just breeders or as the Christian uh, leader Tertullian said, we were just incubators for the male seed, you know, as if we were good for nothing else, you know, um, and, uh, you know, it, but then, but then, because of Rianne Eisler's work, Rianne pivots into social justice because you see all of the values of the sacred feminine or values that patriarchy sees as weak. And I'll read some of those. Love, peace, equality, tolerance, inclusiveness, beauty, intuition, affirming women's bodies and life cycles, being wise stewards of Mother Earth, strengthening female bonds, creating partnership and win-win collaborations rather than competition, shared leadership, um, sharing our wisdom and talents, you know, of, of, you know, women sharing their wisdom and talents, you know, women using our voices to stand up, you know, all of these different things that we've had to suppress or we haven't been able to put at the center of our dominator culture, um, we realize how that has damaged women, but also damaged men as well, because they grow up feeling, you know, like, you know, they have to be tough guys and, um, you know, all the things to make a manly man and, you know, that sort of thing, instead of, you know, other roles that men could, can play besides aggressors or dominators. And uh, so, so Rianne Eisler's work, uh, you know, as she goes in, starts to pivot into partnership, it really makes me start to look at, um, you know, now this is also about the values in society. This, this is, you know, this is how we change the world. This is how we make the world a better place for everyone. You know, not just a select few who have the power and the money and the influence. So it, I, I, I was on a mission, you know, and uh, I started realizing that if I didn't learn about this till I was 30 years old, there had to be a lot of other people out there not connecting the dots as well. And, uh, you know, so that's that's kind of where where I am at this point. And I'm also starting to see goddess as a vehicle toward ascension you know that's sort of the you know the next step uh on this spiritual journey for myself but i also want to stress this isn't just about women you see i don't look at it you know like the dalai lama said it would be western women who would save the world i don't believe it's going to be women who can save the world i really do believe you know it's not about our genitals you know it's about the values that we hold and value um, and live and those can be held just as much by men you know as they can by women because they're you know, my husband included, I know an incredible, you know, uh, cadre of men out there who are feminists, who believe in these goddess values, who aren't intimidated by strong women, aren't intimidated by a feminine face of God. But the thing is, you know, the way I was taught uh, it's like life is a pendulum, you know, or society is a pendulum. And you know, maybe in a lot of cultures, the pendulum started out where uh, we focused on goddess, but then we lost her and goddesses became saints, maybe like Bridget, you know, uh, in order to survive or 
uh, black Madonnas, you know, uh, black Madonnas, oftentimes you'll see underneath the paint, it was really an Isis and a Horus statue. Uh, or like in mm. the country India, goddesses were became domesticated, you know, and they're no more than uh, a minor player, uh, you know, they go from universal goddess creatrix of the world to some god's wife, you know, so they're marginalized. So, you know, we start to see that, um, uh, you know, how important it is, you know, as things started to shift toward patriarchy and we lost that feminine face of God, in order for us to get back to balance, we have to really focus on what we lost. You know, what was the sacred feminine? Why is she important? And I think that's why we're talking tonight because, you know, we're trying to get the idea across that, you know, all of these different things we're saying that the sacred feminine embodies, you know, we have to really know it and believe it and, um, and I guess live it. And then once we have a handle on that, we have that under our belt and we understand what we lost, then we can go back to center, you know, and, and, and sort of incorporate the divine feminine and sacred masculine together in wholeness and oneness. Um, so <laughs> I just covered 30,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I think my jaw is dropping right now with everything you just shared. That was really profound. And thank you for allowing me to interrupt you a little just to get the titles of those books. Um, and if you can send me the name of that one book from uh, Heidi. Adam, Heidi. Yeah, and I'll put it in the replay email too. Um, so you know what, Karen, um, we were going to talk a little bit right now about the thousand goddesses gathering and I've already mentioned it a bit. But I want to go in another direction also because Mother Gaia is like tapping me right now. Um, so let me just say really briefly, the thousand goddesses gathering global grid, as I mentioned before, is based on the Tibetan prophecy that when a thousand goddesses or Tibetan Tars unite, it will shift the tone of our sacred earth from fear to compassion. And um, it, it gets into the realms of what is subtle activism and the power of prayer, the power of ceremony, calling in spiritual teams. And on the spirit planes, everything is energy regardless, which is what we're waking up to more and more with this, all the awarenesses that are growing as we shift into the new earth. So the thousand goddesses gathering is an opportunity for everybody to join, whether you're masculine or feminine in your birth, you know, or, uh, or non-binary, uh, but the ceremony, the power ceremony and calling in spirit teams is highly, highly potent to help us call in spirit teams who are ready and willing to support us with birthing this new earth and clearing the denser energies that have been, that are so ensconced within the patriarchal systems. So having said that, with everything that you shared, Karen, about um, your path and the history of the goddess traditions, my path has been with Native American teachers for 26 years. And so I, as I mentioned before, I was raised Catholic. And yeah, when I started learning that we had a planetary caretaker who really existed as a powerful spiritual being, and then working with a Cherokee teacher who could communicate with her, and then mother, I call her just mother, Mother Gaia, was brought into my energy body in a ceremony in 2012. You know, this is where the goddess as our planetary caretaker is a huge aspect of life here on Earth. You know, she is life. You know, her energy is embodied in all the trees, all the plants, the water. Her energy is embodied in us. You know, the fact that we have bodies with bones and tissue and blood. I mean, our bones come from mother's bones you know, the, the, the minerals in the soil make up our bones. And so, you know, I, for many years in this goddess kind of trying to wrap my head around in my heart, I, I originally, I'm like, mother's not a goddess. Mother's our planetary caretaker. She is, you know, but, but I'm okay now. People think she's a goddess too. Even like the Virgin Mary is the Virgin Mary, a goddess. Um, I know the Virgin Mary is far, far more powerful than, what I was taught in the Catholic Church. And by the way, 
Mother Gaia and the Virgin Mary are very, very close. Uh, and they sit on a spiritual council of divine feminine ones. The others are not ones who have been known here on earth as any deities or whatever. Uh, and they have been from their spiritual realms coming forward with the energies for the new spirituality on earth. Um, and as I'm saying that to you, I'm feeling energy moving through me. Maybe somebody else is in our group too. So I don't want to get too far afield with that, but it just felt really important um, in the realms of what I have surrendered to do and surrounding to serve mother is to bring our mother as in mother Gaia, who is our foremost mother back into the vernacular, back into our culture because uh, indigenous peoples have never forgotten her and they are baffled that we in the Western society forgot her, lost her. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, well, and that's why, you know, I, when I read that opening, you know, I, I believe like you do, you know, I feel like she permeates everything, you know, everything, yeah. you know, I believe she's the cosmos. She's the Akashic record, um, you know, uh, and, you know, in that invocation to Isis, you know, I, I use Isis as a symbol, you know, to focus on. And I think that's, you know, to a certain extent, that's what a lot of people do. You know, I mean, look, we've been trying to answer the age old question, you know, what is God? What is God us since, you know, since humans have been on the planet. Right. And um, and I think it's so immense that we don't have language for it, that we can't even wrap our minds around it. Our And, and you know, and, and because of our, you know, our finite monkey brains, you know, it's easier to see her in Aphrodite or Isis or this glorious tree or the sunset or this river or your ladybug, you know, and, and it's true. She's all, it's, she is all those things. And she is, and she most definitely is mother earth and the volcanoes and the tsunamis and everything. But, you know, it's so hard to encapsulate that, you know, and, you know, and, and my path too has, um, has had the mystic in it, you know, it hasn't only been the left brain intellectual, because, you know, while, you know, I am all those things, you know, I'm also a priestess. And, you know, we would, uh, you know, we would work with energies and magic and trance work and shamanic journeying, um, you know, to connect and have conversations with her or receive downloads from her. So, you know, uh, you know, we have lots in common while at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, we we uh, I I think there's so many flavors of goddess out there, and that's such a wonderful thing. I I mean, I took a hiatus for about three years when my husband fell and hit his head and had a brain injury. And when I came back into the world again, and I discovered a uh, um, Karen um, Karen's Divine Feminine app, and I looked at that and I saw all the incredible work being done out there around the world and especially all the different flavors of goddess that were out there it was like you know hallelujah you know she's breaking through and um to so many people in so many different ways and we're seeing so many faces and flavors of of uh, she of 10,000 names yeah thank you thank you karen it's um Wow. You know, I want to speak to something you just mentioned. And I said in the beginning that I'm a Gaia high priestess and you're a priestess. And it is really amazing and beautiful and needed how many women are re-membering their role as a priestess in past lives. And there are all sorts of women leading priestess trainings. And actually, I, the year-long course I teach, The Great Mother Love Way, you can choose to be a Gaia priestess at the end or love worker or whatever title works for you. Um, but Mother is definitely calling the, the priestesses to wake up because she needs us to ground the divine feminine, the sacred feminine back into our culture, into the planet, into how we live our lives. Uh, and... I want to now, there's there's a 
there's a conversation here, Karen, that we haven't fully had yet about, um, you know, what is the goddess for you or what is the goddess for me? So would you respond to that? We talked a little bit, but maybe we, we can draw it a little bit more. Well, um, you know, that's, it's, a, that's been an evolution for me, you know, in, in the very beginning, I'd say, um, you know, I believed, uh, it was probably most, mostly historical, you know, history, uh, and, you know, I was interested in learning about the, uh, you know, the, the foundations of all of this, because I didn't want to delude myself with a fantasy, uh, but then the more I started to work with her and um, and I realized it, I believe that she has uh, had her wings around me for a very long time. And I believe she has guided me and I've been fortunate enough to see the breadcrumbs, um, you know, it, you know, we we talk about, you know, how the universe um, intercedes in our life and we call it the universe or the source or the all that is I mean I can just as easily substitute the word goddess or divine feminine or Isis in that you know and um, I, I do believe that we are part of her um, and and she is part of us and it's it's as if uh, you know, we all heard that cliche, well, you know, we're part of the divine spark. Um, that's, a, in my mind, that's a way to think of it, or maybe it's the divine flow, you know, and the more we can uh, help ourselves not be so distracted and have more time to meditate and try to connect, I think um, we can become more open to um you know, our purpose or um, where we're, you know, maybe potentially being directed or guided for um, what we're here to do, you know. Um, so, so yeah, for me, I felt that my mission has been uh, to bring people to the sacred feminine, to help them discover what was so profound for me, uh, you know, when I discovered it, because it's been, you know, the focus of my entire life. And I went from, you know, being this, you know, very green priestess who knew nothing, literally nothing about goddess, to, um, you know, leading sacred tours and, you know, bringing people to these sacred sites and, and doing ritual at these sacred sites, connecting with the energy of, you know, goddess in these sacred places where she was once worshipped. And, you know, and I realized, you know, again, we all envision goddess differently, you know, for some, it, you know, she's monotheistic, you know, maybe she's like a diamond and all of these names we have for her are like facets it's within the diamond or for some people you know they're literally you know we say she of 10,000 names you know there are literally 10 different uh, 10,000 different aspects of goddess you know or she's a divine tree you know and all of the different branches or aspects of her you know I don't think it really matters um, I really don't think it matters as long as we uh, cultivate a connection and um, and as as much as in my mind, it's as much about uh, cultivating that connection with her. And and, you know, and I'm not saying that I think the all is a she, um, you know, I really think about some of the earliest cultures who had their deities as androgynous. Um, I really do think um the all in my mind more than likely is not either gender, but both genders, you know, all that is, uh, but it's easier for me to see her and focus on her as a her, especially if we're trying to rebirth values of um, the feminine, but, but, uh, you know, but I think besides cultivating that connection, the other part of this, the other piece that's so important is, you know, 
we want to have a better world for all of us. You know, we want to manifest a new normal. So I don't care really if you, if you're a deity, if, if it's Jesus or Osiris or, um, you know, I don't know, the spaghetti God. Um, to me, it's important that, you know, the values that you believe and you live and you try to incorporate into the world, the label, you know, I, I, I think most of the time is meaningless um, to a certain extent, you know, uh, and, and as I'm still on this journey, um, you know, and I'm starting to think more about ascension and frequencies and vibrations and, and, you know, and I've met a lot of women here in Oregon who are really um, interested in this and I've been listening to them and I realized that when they talk about ascension, which I don't know you, I think you're maybe called the new earth, you know, when they talk about mm -hmm. ascension, you know, they're talking about helping us vibrate on a higher frequency so that we can attain ascension. And here's the kicker. In order to vibrate on those higher frequencies, we have to be living those values that are the sacred feminine values. So it's like mm -hmm. hand in glove in my mind, you know. So I don't know if that's yeah. your question. Yeah. Um... <laughs> No, this again, this is such a huge topic. And I love what you've shared, because there's such deep wisdom there. Um, by the way, we're asking that any comments or anything in the chat box be held, uh, be silent there until we get to Q&A, just so we're not getting distracted. Thank you. Uh, gosh, I'm trying to like, okay, because we want to get into some other meat here. Uh, hmm. I just want to speak briefly to uh, the goddess, the goddess being for me, uh, the creatrix is our foremost divine feminine. That's what I call her in our universal realms. She is the womb of creation. And, and I'm paraphrasing some of what Karen was saying and read from her book, from her source, source is all that is in our universe. This is my cosmology. Uh, and within the realms of the goddess of as deities i actually feel them you know i can feel the difference between danu or bridget or uh, kali or isis so to me they're very different spiritual beings but they all embody the goddess energies and mother guy's energy is different than you know them and the virgin mary so this is part of my life experience and and yet i also really want to speak to the goddess within us, because this has been a huge part of my journey in embracing the goddess. And that is coming to truly walk in my life on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm not always there by any means with the understanding that I am the goddess and it's not an egotistical thing. Mm -hmm. It says, I want to embody the the archetypal energies of the goddess so like for instance i just bought a really beautiful kuan yin pendant carved of dark green jade at a buddhist temple just a few days ago so i was working with kuan yin this morning with this beautiful piece feeling her compassion energies coming into me so that i could embody this for my day um as an example but but I also want to speak to, and, and actually we're going to get to in a few minutes. I'm looking at the time, Karen. Um, let's keep on going and talk about how, you know, goddess spirituality looks for us in our lives. So please feel free to share how goddess spirituality um, plays out for you on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, um, if you were able to walk into my living room, uh, my living room is... Um, for the most part, an Egyptian temple. Um, it's filled with statues of uh, Isis and Sekhmet and Anubis and Osiris and Toth, uh, primarily the Egyptian pantheon. And in my dining room, you know, there's uh, Artemis and Aphrodite and the snake goddess and Athena, as you know, as I look around the room. Um, and there's also that goddess um, Ginsburg, the, you know, the Supreme Court Justice. <laughs> um, 
And, uh, but you know, there's, but Kali is here too. And, um, and, you know, and, and other um, symbols, you know, that, that are the sacred feminine. So I, I like to sort of permeate my space um, with, um, you know, with, with these symbols of the sacred feminine so that, you know, when I wake up, uh, it's a constant reminder, you know, um, I try to uh, wake up in gratitude, um, you know, as, as much as I can, um, you know, uh, I, I try to, you know, find time to meditate, um, I teach a lot, um, I, I believe even, you know, secular things or spiritual work, you know, whether it be uh, writing a book or doing my podcast or teaching a class, you know, I feel like it's all my priestess work. You know, it doesn't, you know, the left brain stuff counts just as much as the right brain stuff, you know, and hopefully, hopefully I am you know, walking a path of a priestess, you know, and I fail, of course, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm a work in progress, but I try to always, you know, default to those values, you know, and, you know, and I think for women, um, you know, I, I really do try to work with women a lot because, you know, as Carol Christ said, you know, women need the goddess, um, you know, I, I think maybe even more than men because, um, you know, goddess affirms the legitimacy and the beneficence of female power. Um, you know, she, uh, goddess affirms the female body and the life cycles. Um, goddess is also a positive affirmation of women's will and power. And it's a and she kind of, I think, encourages us to reevaluate women's bonds together, you know. So to me, it's so, you know, while it is a connection, uh, a spiritual connection, because I've had so many magical experiences of Isis and Sekhmet, um, especially related to medical issues, you know, where they were there for me, or, you know, when my husband fell and hit his head and had a brain injury, um, life just turned into chaos. But looking back, I really feel like it was her hand extricating us from a toxic a living situation we were in and putting us on a better path to where we are now. So, you know, it's a, it's a big subject. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't know if, if, and I think it's very different than yours. You know, I feel like mine's a little bit, my relationship with her is a little bit more autonomous then and, and I envy you almost, you know, um, hearing her whispers to you every day, you know, what I wouldn't give to be that clairaudient. I mean, I feel like I am, but I don't hear her whispering to me every day as you do. And that's so beautiful. I'd love to hear more wow. about that. <laughs> well, thank you. Wow. Um, hmm, that's that's a really long conversation right there of how my life works, because I am being guided you know, especially these days, like moment by moment. And I want to get back to something that, you know, you were talking about meditation and being still so you can hear. And I got very clear instructions from mother <clears throat> right around um, Christmas, early January, where she said, I need you to be in stillness as much as possible all the time so that I can guide you. This is what she said to me. So, I'm I'm living life really differently now with this process of stilling myself because I have monkey mind too, like a lot of us in our Western culture. And but it is truly magical and wonderful and and mysterious how Mother is bringing people to me for the work she wants me to do. She's bringing the resources to me, and I'm not in the place of angst the way. I have been most of my life of how am I going to do this? How am I going to pay my bills? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, so, so it is an adventure and I, I appreciate if you're a little envious, it's also really hard. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> um, 
What pressure? Well, I want to speak. <laughs> yeah, I know it is, especially when she asked me to do something like write the Great Mother Bible, which is like the word Bible in the title. I'm like, Mother, I can't do that. She's like, You're the one. All you need to do is listen. So I did it because I had surrendered to her because she helped me heal from cancer without the doctors completely. So I, I kind of owed her, you know, but it's not about that. Um, but I want to speak a little bit to what my spirituality looks like in my personal life. And I'm looking at the time, so we're just going to have to keep on going here. But um, as an example of my spirituality and how I honor the goddess, uh, this is one example that just happened today. We have a bird feeder right outside the glass doors on our deck. And there was a dead bird this morning, a beautiful goldfinch that had hit the glass door. And in my role as a Gaia priestess, I know that whenever I see a dead animal and I can do this, I will bury that animal and do ceremony and honor the sacredness of that beautiful being. So this afternoon, after it's, the rain stopped, I went out and um, took tobacco and did a little ceremony to honor that one's life. You know, sometimes I have scooped up roadkill on the side of the road in the neighborhood where I used to live, um, which isn't necessarily fun, but uh, but all life is sacred, you know? So this is part of how I practice my spirituality. And but and again, what you were saying, you know, holding the archetypal energies, if you want to say, word it that way, of the compassion. What is it the that the goddess embodies? And sometimes it's really setting boundaries, like the 21 Taras, if you study them, have very different energies to them and some of them are fierce warriors like this shall not happen again it's like the mother picking up the car and moving her child out from underneath or the mama bear protecting her cubs that is a goddess energy also it can be interpreted that way um but my day-to-day -day life involves and it might this is my main altar right behind me here actually um but my everyday life starts out with ceremony at my altar which is a medicine wheel of sacred objects and sacred water from around the world um and so my way of life means is recognizing that i have spirit teams you know it's not just mother gaia it's the virgin mary it's more it's angelic groups um I, the list is kind of long at this point it's really humbling uh and they're supporting me all the time with what i need to do uh they're a big part of the great mother love way course that i teach year-long course and uh i also work with the nature spirits that's a huge part of my goddess um uh, spirituality life practice and they communicate with me i communicate with them they're amazing <laughs> uh, but i am really a solitary as far as a priestess goes i don't do ceremony with a lot of other groups you know or one main group there are women that do that um anyway i'm looking at the time so what i would love to do right now karen is um you mentioned a little bit about the new earth if you don't mind let me talk a little bit about my sort of gestalt about the new earth and then let's get into this wounded feminine wounded masculine piece and we will see we'll try to still make time for q a okay um you know my work in surrendering to mother and her giving me guidance all the time i, I the way i word it is yammering at me and it's usually on this side i hear her it's interesting uh is the new earth that's coming in right now call it full ascension call it the birthing of the new earth is 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 this evolutionary process as karen mentioned of the raising of the energies here on earth and it's happening right now it's been happening and building up over the past 15 20 years it's becoming more exponential and where we're headed as i understand it is to a way of being where we are living in a state of joy as humans we are living in complete balance and harmony with all of the sacred seen and unseen ones around the world, within our communities, in our neighborhoods. And I'm talking about the nature spirits, the tree devas. Um, we will be able to communicate far more telepathically and we'll be trusting that all of our needs are met because we're shifting into a higher dimensional space. They say fifth dimension and beyond. Uh, this is where we're headed. And we're going through the bumpy phase right now, really bumpy. It's getting bumpier. Um, and so the calling for each one of us within these changes is to do our inner work, which is a good segue, Karen, to talking about what is the wounded feminine and what is the wounded masculine? Because the, these 
patterns of woundedness within us are holding us back as individuals and from holding us back as society collectively from fully birthing with ease and grace this new earth. So do you want to speak a little bit, Karen, about the wounded feminine? Well, you know, I think um, our society is wounded. Um, I think our society is wounded from um, not having a feminine face of God. In fact, I just read this the other night at a class I gave, and I'll, I'll make this quick because I think it answers your question. The sacred feminine, whether an archetype, an ideology, or a heavenly deity that rules the fates of humankind, the world has been wounded from our absence, much like a child growing up without a mother. Humans are in chaos and disharmony in part because the feminine face of God has been stripped from too many of our cultures, religions, and psyches. We're like children with an emptiness in our heart that will not heal, and we compensate in ways that have had tragic consequences for humankind. The dogma of human-made patriarchal religion, professing the only valid truth is revering a monotheistic male god, has attempted to dethrone goddess from her place as creatrix of the world for thousands of years. People resisted. They changed the names of goddess to Mary, Mary Magdalene, Kuan Yin, Guadalupe, or they call her St. Bridget. They built grand cathedrals in her name, but we are starting to remember the roots and true origins of the divine feminine. She's not a fantasy. Evidence of her lives in museums, art, textiles, parables, myths, archaeological sites, if we just seek her out. She is the missing piece of the puzzle that can lend harmony and guidance to issues of power, war, and politics. She sheds, sheds light on the meaning of love, life, and death. She brings up a, a mother's unconditional love and inspires us with hope. She embodies the laws of duality, polarity, multiplicity, reciprocity, and attraction, right action, and justice, or her credos. So that's that was um, something that I wrote, you know, with my first book, um, walking. Well, my second book, walking an ancient path, and and I think that sort of speaks to the wound that you know, we, that we have, but I feel like we can heal the wound. You know, women don't have to be second class citizens. Men can be more their authentic self and don't have to live up to this, you know, patriarchal ideal of what manhood is. Um, if the sacred feminine is restored uh, alongside the sacred masculine, you know, we, you know, we want this power couple, you know, whether it's Jesus and Mary Magdalene or Isis and Osiris, you know, we need this archetype of the power couple where, um, you know, we, we have these healthy boundaries, embrace our masculine and feminine. And I think that helps us begin to heal those wounds. Mm, thank you. Um, thank you. And I want to just add to what you were sharing that because those of us in the Western culture have been uh, in our current generation preceded by so many generations of woundedness and of suppression of the feminine without a feminine face of God, uh, there are, it, I think it would be a rare woman walking the planet today who doesn't need to do womb healing work yeah. Uh, and I have some good friends like Emmy Mutali and others who focus specifically on womb healing, the repressed energies. And my personal journey has included having lymphoma, you know, swollen lymph nodes in my womb space area because of all the repressed energies there. And uh so in this process, this journey of healing, healing the shame, healing the guilt, healing the voice inside that says, I'm not good enough, or I'm in trouble, that so many women embody because it's what our mothers believed, it's what their grandmothers believed, um, it's what the patriarchal system has put on us. Um, this is really a deep, deep process. And healing ourselves is the hardest work. So yeah. kudos to anybody and everybody who's really making a commitment, but we all need to be stepping forward for this. And I just want to add with the love of the mother, 
behind us, we can find the inner strength to heal those layers of woundedness. So we're not alone. Um, so do we want to talk a little bit about wounded masculine? We've been kind of, you know, alluding to wounded masculine by saying patriarchal. And I'm happy to speak on that if you want um, to keep on going. But you go well, ahead I, if you want. I just have a tiny piece. And if you can add more, because I've been more focused on helping women because, you know, the patriarchal religions out there today are still, um, you know, brainwashing and conditioning women with, you um, you know, such horrible ideas uh, of how they're supposed to be in the world, you know, and, um, and, and, you know, and, and I, and it causes so much damage, you know, I mean, when you think about the sexism and the misogyny, it's, it's done by men, generally, but not always, you know, I mean, women prop up, you um, bad institutions, patriarchal institutions, uh, you know, dominator institutions. I mean, women are responsible for uh, female genital mutilation of other women, you know, because it's uh, always been their tradition. Uh, but I think, um, you know, Matthew Fox, who um, did the foreword of my Normalizing Abuse book, um, he's a, an incredible, uh, he's a heretic priest, and he was um, um, kicked out of, uh, you know, of organized religion by the Vatican because he hung out with Native Americans and, you know, uh, goddess people and pagans, and he wasn't willing to always toe the line of the church, you know. Um, and I would have to say, Google Matthew Fox and look at his titles, but I know he has a book out there about healing the masculine and new role models for men. And one, for instance, the one that sticks in my mind, you know, besides, um, you know, being your authentic self, and if that means you're an artist or something like that, you follow it, you know, you don't have to give in to this toxic masculinity. Um, you know, one role model is protector instead of aggressor, you know, and, and that one stuck with me because I feel like we're living in this dominator culture where men feel like they have to be the toxic masculine aggressor, the strong man, you know, um, we see it in autocracies, you know, all around the world. And it's something that's being sold to us in this election year, you know, we just want a strong man to take over and we don't have to think anymore. Um, so, but, you know, but that's, you know, kind of selling us a bill of goods, uh, because, you know, there's, there are just so many things that happens with the toxic masculine, you know, the domestic violence, the sexual abuse, um, human trafficking. Um, I mean, I, I, I have a chapter in my book, um, about abuse in society and culture and, um, you know, women and children have been at the margins of societies around the world. Um, you know, women simply because they, you know, make less pay all their life, 70% of them retire in poverty. Um, I mean, there's, there's so, there's so much that happens because the masculine is wounded and hasn't been able to incorporate these values of the feminine into their lives and feel comfortable about it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Let me listen. Thank you, Karen. I just want to add to what you're sharing and that in the healing of the wounded masculine is the healing of the heart. And also for the masculine <clears throat> to feel safe enough to express their hearts, to cry, to release their own sorrow, their guilt, their pain. <clears throat> and it's true for the women too. I mean, and we're being really general because we have to, we have so little time here, but um, you know, one of the things that's been so pandemic, if I may word it that way within the Western culture is the wounding of our hearts and within the wounded masculine realms and the Cherokee teacher that I was with used to talk about the angry God religions. You know, it's like, there's a lot of woundedness when your God is angry at you and going to condemn you to the hell. Uh, so part of this healing of the wounded masculine, and it's the healing of everyone in our society is feeling safe. You know, how can we feel safe around each other 
so that we can really be authentic as you worded it, but also to, to come from our hearts. And that is where the new earth is. That's where the full ascension is, is living, not just from the intellectual active, you know, powerful mind, but living from our hearts that then guides the mind. So this yeah. is part of the healing process. And I'm looking at the time and it's like, oh my gosh, this conversation is so rich. Um, so I, I just want to add really quickly, if any of you are wondering how to get started on your goddess path, if you are in that place or you're part of the way, we're all in, in the process. Um, there are obviously many resources. There are priestess schools. There are womb healers like my friend Emmy Mutali, a feminine revered. Uh, there's just joining a sister circle. And this is where the Divine Feminine app, and I'll put the link to the Divine Feminine app in the replay email. Um, joining a sister circle and just being supported by your sisters is just really, really beautiful and needed these days. So upon that note, Karen, if you're okay, I'd love to open it up for 10 minutes. Maybe we can go 15 minutes, five minutes over. Um, who would like to ask a question? And you can raise your hand and unmute yourself or put a question in the chat. So who would like to? Anybody? And Samantha was posting things as we were talking um, earlier. Thank you, Samantha, for those notes. Anybody? Okay, I see Tom's phone. Tom. Yes. Simply, in simple terms, what would you say is the essence of goddess spirituality to sum it up <laughs> um, um, would you like to answer that <laughs> um you know what if if i had to give you a one word answer um it would be love you know i i think everything we've talked about if you really get down to it it's about releasing fear and uncertainty and being in a place of love. Because if we could be in love, then everything else would flow from that. Gratitude, compassion, um, you know, tolerance, um, you know, beauty, peace. Um, yeah, I, I think I think love and, you know, maybe a close second would be, um, you know, trying to fight ignorance and, um, You know, and uh, and and also too, you know, uh, improving our connection with nature. You know, let you know, bring that back, bring that aspect back into our life because it's so vital. That mm. sacredness of thank nature. Thank you, and I. Thank you. I was just going to say, I would say, uh, waking back up to the sacredness of all that's around us and within us, and who we are as sacred beings, divine beings. Um. So. Thank you, Tom's phone. Thomas is a good friend of mine. Um, <laughs> David, would you like to ask something or share? Actually, yeah, I'd just like to uh, share that under being in this uh, goddess circle business is pretty new for me, like within the last year. And uh, you were giving some books that that uh, were important, and and, and I can say that uh, a woman, a book I read this fall called "When God Was a Woman" by Merlin Stone, apparently uh, yeah. a major uh, reference, is forcing me to reevaluate everything I know about society and and the world that I live in. Yeah. So it's a, that's a, to me, that's, that's an important book. Actually, um, that's usually the second book I mentioned, the, section, the second nonfiction book, Merlin Stone. Uh, wonderful book. I totally agree. And But I promise you, if you go over to Rian Eisler's Chalice and the Blade, that one's going to blow you away, too. <laughs> okay, well, I just, I, just down, I just downloaded that to my Kindle while we were talking today. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. 
who else would like to ask a question or mention, you know, any awarenesses that may have come forward for you? We have six minutes if we keep it to 60 to 90 minutes for this whole event. Anybody else? I would love to RJ. Say to, I'll be one question. Actually, it's hard to hear you. Go, can you I'm talk a little closer you. to you? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'll take you on. Oh, now we can't hear you at all. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, perfect. Much better. Perfect. Okay. So question, which is probably for both of you. Do you remember, or did you have an actual moment when you remember that you stopped seeing God as a uniquely male deity? Right. Cause I, I was brought up in a very fundamental Christian background as well. And so like, it was like a massive epiphany to me when I kind of had a realization that it's not just about a male and also a beautiful when you were talking about wounded masculine and wounded feminine and I just wrote down um which I hope you don't mind me sharing I just wrote down yes it seems for as long as patriarchal systems and monotheism has reigned we've all been missing our mother men and women just as an orphaned or abandoned child would so the wounding is kind of a no-brainer isn't it I mean you know if you look at family systems and how children suffer so much when their mother, mother has never been there so it's very beautiful that this is coming back in for men and women yeah yeah because you Thank know you. um you know when patriarchy entered the equation you know um patriarchy was turning things you know on their head to replace the mother you know you see athena is suddenly birthed from zeus's head uh you know god birthed the world eve came from adam's rib you know so i mean they're trying desperately to take over the role of life giver and mother because it's so primal so um so necessary and um but you know they they do do all they can you just can't replace the mother like that you know mm, no did you want to speak, Karen, to when you had an epiphany of sorts or huge epiphany that you realized that God was not the be-all and end-all as this figure, white man with a beard in the sky? Which, by the way, both the men who spoke in this uh, are white men with beards, so <laughs> no judgment on you guys, but, you know, the God in the sky with the beard is a little, like, uh, not where I'm at these days. But go ahead. I don't know if you want to share anything about that, Karen. Well, you know, I think, um, I, I mean, it, it's like, you you know, you know things and then you know things, if, if, if that makes sense. I mean, I knew it intellectually. Um, I think when I started taking these goddess classes, when I moved from Louisiana to California, but what, what I think really brought it home to me was being in places like the Louvre Museum or the British Museum and um or or being in these sacred sites where you know she was worshipped um you know at the center of society and i think that really brought it home to me that um you know that 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 was that it was uh it, it, it was it was so potent and so real you know and we forget you know uh the eleusinian mysteries of demeter and persephone were practiced for 2000 years i think but, you know, we, we forget about that unless it's brought back to us to think about, you know, and, and remember. Mm. And if I may respond, RJ, to your question, um, I pretty much left the Catholic Church in my 20s when I was in college, early 20s. But I found my way because I was dealing with a lot of depression to an ashram um, huge, huge yoga center where the guru was teaching um about a different form of god so to speak but it wasn't about the angry god it wasn't about the 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 guilt and the shame and the sin message and that's when i started to really open up to wow this is really cool there's a cult you know way of believing here about you know the spirituality that's not 
uh, condemning. Um, uh, so that I would say, I, I can't remember one specific epiphany, but it was more like, this feels more fun and safe and loving over here. And then I fell in with the Native American teachers and I'm like, mother, <laughs> there's mother. Oh my God, let's bring mother's love in. Everybody needs mother's love. So yeah. uh, any other questions or thoughts? We really need to wrap it up like in a minute if we're going to stay to 90 minutes. Um, so I, maybe this is this wraps it up for us tonight. Oh, I did actually, Karen, you, um, right, before we get off here, I was going to sing a song and, and then you were going to end ceremony the way you do with your tradition and then I'll close it the way I do with the spirit team. So if you're still good for us going another minute or two. Yeah, yeah, I, I, um, I'm I'm not pressed for time. If people did have questions, I'm you know happy to stay a bit longer rather than have them go away without their question being asked. And I'm also open to anyone contacting me. You know, they um, I, I guess hmm. Mayor is probably going to put our contact information. Um, but uh, you know, my email address is Karen Tate 108 at yahoo.com. And if I could, Mayor, I just wanted to mention my podcast real quick. Um, I've, Please, been on, yeah. I've been on the air like 13 years and I've been lucky enough to interview incredible men and women, foremothers and way showers. Some of them have left, have left this, this earth. And I'm so glad that their voices <laughs> remain, um, you know, providing their wisdom, but it's voices of the sacred feminine. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. And I would welcome you to join me. It's uh, every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, or you can listen later from the archives. I would like to add a thought if that's allowed. Go ahead, Thomas. I got into the acceptance of the divine feminine through a much different route. It was with my work with angels and who can present uh, as male, they could present as female or actually both or neither. And I realized that within them, depending on their mission, they would express one gender or the other, depending on the nature of their mission. And I won't get in, in, into details, what this throws into question is the role of gender in creation. Mm -hmm. It led me to the conclusion that the point of creation was probably neither male or female, but it wasn't until we actually got into the manifestation of it that the polar opposites, the male, the female, came into being. And there came in the round of creation that we we know and love so well. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. That's really interesting. That's a whole other webinar conversation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. And by the way, for those of you who are only hearing Thomas and meeting him now, Thomas is extraordinarily gifted. And uh, I think I'll leave it at that. But he can see spirit. So when he talks about working with the angels, he sees them, which is really amazing. Okay, so if we're good with this, I'm going to do a little song that I was making up lyrics for um, in the bathtub yesterday, and I've been doing it actually before that. A lot of us know who have been in the goddess um, realms, the song, We All Come From the Goddess. So let me sing this for you with some other lyrics. So I'll start out with the original ones. Hopefully my voice will work right now. <laughs> we all come from the goddess and to her we shall return we all come from the goddess and to her we shall return like a drop of rain blowing to the ocean like a drop of rain blowing to the ocean i am one with the goddess I return to love. I am one with the goddess. I return to love. I am the goddess. I return to love. I am the goddess. I am one with the stones. I am the goddess. 
I am one with the trees. I am the goddess. I am one with the birds. I am the goddess. I am one with the animals. I am the goddess. I am one with the waters. I am the goddess. I am one with the stars. We all come from the goddess, and to her we shall return. Oh, that was lovely. I think you just created a new goddess chant, Mayor. <laughs> I, I may have. I may have. Would you like to end as you'd end your ceremonies? Sure. Uh, this is, um, you know, this is kind of a, a traditional closing at a lot of goddess circles. It's just very simply, may the circle be open yet unbroken. May the love of the goddess be forever in your heart. Merry meet and merry part and merry meet again. Thank you all for coming mm -hmm. and listening. We sure appreciate it. And I'm now going to officially close ceremony and thank all the spirits here. So to all the beautiful spiritual ones who joined us here to support us and hold us in sacred space, we love you. We honor you. Ceremony is now officially over. Oh, thank you, everybody. Wow. You'll get a replay email and to all who are listening just to the replay. Um, we love you. We honor you too. And Share this with your friends. I'm perfectly fine with that. Share this with your friends. If you're okay with that, Karen, it just came out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fine. People. That's what we're supposed cool. to be doing. Cool. All right. Lots of love to everybody. And Karen, you're the best. This has been a real treat. And we'll look forward to you and I interview, doing the interview next week, next Wednesday. Yep. Yeah, tune in, everybody. And uh, we're not going to be having the same conversation. It's going to be a brand new conversation uh, when Mayor's with me next Wednesday. So yeah, yeah. I hope some of you tune in. Or get the replay, right, from your podcast link. Yeah, yeah. Or you get the right. from the archives. Bye, everybody. Okay. Love and hugs. Bye.